don't know if you're familiar with that song by the birds, Turn, Turn, Turn. But those words come directly out of the Bible, actually. That whole uh, uh, verse and chorus comes out of a passage in Ecclesiastes, written by a king, written by an influencer, written by a man who said, I'm going to root my identity in the stuff I do. I'm going to root my identity in the things I accomplish. I'm going to root who I am into the music I write, the literature I write. And so his journey was that he wrote the lyrics that turned into the lyrics that the birds used for that song to say, I found a problem. It seems like every time I rooted myself in something, things would turn. Things would change. Times were always changing. And so it was hard to, to root my identity in something that was constant. So there's, there's five meanings that, or five sources that all of us need. We need a source of meaning, a source of purpose. All of us are looking for a source of satisfaction in our life, a source of hope, but also a source of identity. All the different hats you wear, the CEO hat, the employer hat, the employee hat, the mom hat, the dad hat, the coach hat. Who is your core self? That's what an identity really is. Who is the, the core identity of who you are regardless of what hat you wear? And is that self durable that the same you still exists regardless of what you're doing or what hat you're wearing at the time? It's that place you get your core sense of worth and your core sense of identity. Now often in every culture, your culture pushes that on you and tells you how to find your identity. But you don't realize it. In fact, you don't realize it because it seems self-evident. Well, everybody knows this. So I want to try and pull back the veil a bit and show you how cultures push philosophies, push truths into you that make us think we should find our identity in one particular way when a different time of history or a different culture might say something different. To do that, I want to begin by looking at um, non-Western cultures. Non-Western cultures in general say that we should get our identity from the outside. The outside. Somebody gives you your identity. Let me put a chart up behind me and I'll show you. A non-Western culture says you get your identity from your family. You're a son. You're a daughter. You're a father. And so you find your identity from the outside, from what your family tells you you are. Your identity comes from your role. The village, our family's always been Masons, and you are a Mason. You find your identity by being a Mason, just like your dad or your grandfather was. And so the culture says, you can know you're worthwhile, you can know you matter because of the role you play, because of the family you're from. Identity comes from your honor. And identity comes from your duties. So think of this as your heart as a giant container here, a lotto, ball, lotto container for the sake of this. And a non-Western culture says, if you want to really fill yourselves up, get enough honor, get enough duty, get enough family, have somebody else tell you where your identity and where your value comes from. And when you fill your life up with that, you'll ultimately be satisfied. The problem with the human heart is it's a whirlwind, isn't it? You think that it's going to satisfy you, but it doesn't. There's this unsettledness that happens within you. It doesn't ever quite fill up. And a good example of this culture, the Romans had this culture as well, um, but there's a classic piece of literature, a poem, if you want to put it up on the screen next. Uh, the poem that's in past year history is called the, uh, the Battle of Malden. And notice here how this poem gives an idea of you find your identity by being a warrior, by having honor. It's a good example of this. There was a crashing of the shields. Then Whiston went forth, Thurston's son. He fought against the warriors. You fight, that's where you find your identity. He was in the press, the killer of three of them, before Wigland's son lay dead among the slain. And they stood fast, these warriors in the warfare. Warriors perishing, yes, they were dying. Warriors wearied by wounds. So Alagathar's son emboldened them all. Often he let go of his spear, the slaughtering spear, flying into the Vikings, so he went forth. First in that crowd. He was the first to go die. The first to be honorable. The first to fight for something that mattered. Hewing and maiming until he perished in battle. He died, but he died an honorable death. This certainly was not the Gothic who flew from the fight. Oh, but to die honorably is better than to be someone who in a coward flew from the flight. So there's an idea where you say you, you get your identity from honor, from a cause, from not being a coward. Now, Western culture, 
is almost the opposite of that. Nobody gives your identity. The culture doesn't give you identity. Your country doesn't give you identity. No, 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 no. Where we grew up, we say, the Western culture says, you find your dreams and your identity yourself. You make it yourself. It says, don't fill it up with that. Instead, your identity comes from your dreams. Follow your dreams. Your identity doesn't come from somebody telling you you're a son or your daughter. No, no, no. That's oppression. It comes from your choices. Make good choices. And if you fill your life up with enough good choices, you'll find a sense of identity. Your accomplishments. If you can just fill your life up with enough accomplishments, then you will finally know you are somebody, that you matter, that you have meaning, that you have purpose. Western culture says, identity comes from your feeling. How do you feel about yourself? Do you have a good self-concept? Do you have a good self-image? And you see how different that is? My dad told me I matter. I matter. Non-Western culture. I dishonored my family. Shame, guilt. Oh, my goodness. Doesn't matter what other people think. Western culture. You are your choices. Here's the problem. The heart is very unsettled. No matter what you put in it, there's this wind, there's this world, there's this dissatisfaction that occurs. And what you find out is there's a hole in every human life. And no matter what you put in, no matter what our culture tells you, it, it just doesn't stay in. All these things that we thought were good, that we could, thought we could get enough to fill us, and yet something in us has this unsettledness. It says, yeah, but it didn't, just one more maybe, just, just I need one more of those. Maybe if I could just accumulate a little bit more, or one more comment from my country, one more award, one more trophy. And what Solomon found, is I think what we find, all these things, like Bob Dylan says, times are changing. All this stuff, you can't anchor it to it because it isn't firm. This uh, Western approach was referenced by a sociologist. He calls it individualized expressism. I love how he says it as we figure out what shaped us and what shapes us daily. He says, expressive individualism is when each person has a unique core of feelings. It's feeling, not honor, not your family. And it's unique to you. And intuition that should unfold and be expressed if individuality is to be released, to be realized, rather. Don't let your family, don't let society, don't let your traditions, don't let your religion impact your view of self. That'd be terrible. No, no, you're not your duties. You're not your, you're your dreams. You are your choices. Now, you start seeing this philosophy all around us, which is why you don't even realize it's being pushed upon you. I'm a Star Trek fan, so it's from Jean-Luc Picard. Jean-Luc Picard turns to a a guy coming into Starfleet, and Jean-Luc Picard gives him a speech. He says, if you're going to go into Starfleet, actually a little more of a British accent, but I can't do the British accent. Without turning into Monty Python, actually. He says, don't go into Starfleet for me. Don't go into Starfleet for your family. If you're going to enroll in Starfleet, do it for yourself. Because then it will matter. There it is. Expressive individualism. You matter. You determine your destiny. Classic example, this is from The Sound of Music, right? It's not the poem from Malden, Die of Victorious Death. It's climb every mountain. Forge every stream, follow every rainbow, and then you'll find your dream. Now, here's the problem. Both of those views have a problem. They're chaining your identity to something that is incredibly insecure. In in the non-Western model, what happens is the minute you dishonor your family in a shame-based culture, oh my goodness, you've shamed not only your family, but your role and your company for generations. I'm the black sheep. How do you unshame yourself? And if something outside of you gives your identity, how do you ever get secure when other people control how you feel about yourself? So we say, well, that's right. That's why I'm a Western. Now, the problem with the Western view is, have you ever looked into your heart? My heart, like that lotto ball machine, is very unsettled. I look inside myself, and one moment I say I want a great career, the next moment I say I want a great marriage. Which should trump? And I end up sacrificing my marriage over my career, or my career over my marriage. One moment I want to be good, I really want to follow the golden rule. Then the the next moment somebody hurts me, and I, I honestly want to be cruel. I want to push their buttons. I want to make them pay. When I have to look into myself to find my meaning, I look inside myself, and I find a lot of gack in there. A lot of brokenness in there. A lot of self-centeredness in there. And if in me is my meaning and purpose, what if you look inside yourself and you haven't found it? What if there is no outside source to find it? 
where you left. In his book, Unapologetic, I love what the writer writes. He says, when you examine human beings, their hearts, their motivations, (laughs) he says, you are a being whose wants make no sense. You truly want to possess and not possess at the same time. You are equipped more for farce or tragedy than for a happy ending. Well, isn't that the truth? To which I think Solomon, as he goes through this journey, trying to tie his identity to something that matters, he realized that the only thing, the only thing in life that's constant is change. And he realized, though he tried it, that he shouldn't chain his identity to something that changes. The only constant in life is change, so don't chain your identity to something that changes. Well, then what can I chain it to? Well, let's look at what Solomon found. He found that everything was in change, and yet he also found that there was one thing that didn't change. Everything is in constant change. Here's where the words come from, from that song by the birds. It comes right out of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He says, I was trying to find something to root my identity in. I realized to everything there's a season, but it's just a season. It turns. Times they are a changing. There's a time to be born, but then you can't really trust in your health because there's also time to die. There's a time to plant and to work, but there also comes a time to pluck out and your career's over and that season's over and that endeavor is over. There's a time to kill. There's evil. There's people who have to stand up as warriors and fight honorably. But there's also a time to heal and to save and to rescue and to step back. There's a time to break down. There's also a time to build up. There's a time to weep, and you might find yourself putting your identity in, I'm an empathetic person, but pretty soon that empathy, you take on everybody's troubles, and you find yourself depressed, because now your core identity is found in how other people feel. It was a time to laugh, and he says, well, I'm a a time identity to laughter, and yet life does have problems, and you can't laugh all the time, and that too takes a turn. Everything's in constant change. There's a time to mourn, there's a time to dance. Time to cast away stones and also time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain. Well, that's what I'll do. I'll find my identity in what I gain. Well, there's also going to be a time to lose relationships, accomplishments, things you love, your health, your hair. There's a time to lose. There's a time to keep. A time to throw away, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, a time of peace. As Solomon examined all the things in life and all the things in culture he could tie his identity to, he said, what profit is the worker from all the labor that he labors? What profit has the worker when everything you try and work for eventually takes a turn? What should I do? What are we meant to do? I read an interesting article. I think it's a writer from uh, New York Times, New York Post. His name's Benjamin uh, Nugent. And he said he decided to chain his identity to his work. He was a writer, right? So work became the thing in which I find my identity. People say, what do you do? I say, I'm a writer. And so who I am, the core of who I am is I am a writer. But in this very honest little op-ed he did, he discovered something. He discovered that the more he needed his writing to be his identity, the worse of a writer he became. The more you put the pressure on your marriage to be your source of identity, the more you destroy your marriage because it can't take the pressure. The more you put your pressure on your kids to live up to your expectations and, and not dishonor the family, the more you crumble that relationship. Here's how he says it. When good writing was my only goal, I made the quality of my work The measure of my worth. Wow, that's your identity. For this reason, I wasn't able to read my own writing well. I couldn't tell whether something I'd just written was good or bad because I needed it to be good in order to feel sane. I lost the ability to cheerfully interrogate how much I liked what I'd written, to see what was actually on the page rather than what I wanted to see or what I feared to see. See what he's saying? I tried to chain my identity to my work, and therefore my work needed to bless me. It needed to give me my identity. And I ended up being a bad writer because I couldn't evaluate it and critique it well. 
Now, ironically, he says that what really saved his writing <laughs> is he got a girlfriend for the first time. So once he had a girlfriend, he didn't have all the pressure on work to find his identity. Now, where'd all that pressure go? To the girlfriend. And that's what happens. We've got to chain our identity to something so we just keep swapping, keep putting different things in. And we find out that everything's in change. Nothing can sustain the weight of our identity. I used this about a year ago, but I think it's so honest. Madonna was asked the same thing. Where do you find your identity? How do you know you're a somebody? And I think in a very honest interview that she did uh, for Vogue magazine, she said, I have an iron will. And all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. So she has an identity of insecurity. She's got to conquer it. That's where she's going to find her value. I push past one spell of it, a season of it, and discover myself as a special human being. And then I get to another stage, and I think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. My drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre. That's always been pushing me, pushing me. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. With all her success, with all of her fame, with each level comes another chance to prove you belong there and more. She's trying to chain her identity to something that's in constant change. And Solomon says after many chapters, there at Ecclesiastes, it's just chapter after chapter of all the things he tries to chain his identity to, and none of them work. And one of his conclusions he comes to in chapter 3, he says, I found there's only one thing that's constant. I have seen the God-given task, he says, with which the sons of men are to be occupied. And the one thing I could chain my life to, the meaning and purpose of my life to that didn't change, was God. And that God giving me, a God-given task, to me was me to find out that he can make everything, the good and the bad, everything, the horrible, the loss and the gains, the significant and the painful. He could make everything beautiful in its time. And he has put eternity, this God-sized hole, into the hearts of mankind so nothing else can fill it up. I know that nothing is better for them, human beings, than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. And here's what he chained it to, for this was a gift from God. If I could realize that whatever's going on in my life, I'm chained to how God sees me, the gift of God. That's the one thing that would be secure. Then I could enjoy my work without trying to extract all my meaning from it. I could enjoy my marriage without putting all the pressure on it. If I secured my identity, I could enjoy my career without always needing more. I could find contentment. Look what he says. Know that whatever God does, it'll be forever. That's constant. It doesn't change. Everything else in life changes, but not the gift of God. And that's why even the message of the Bible is different from religion. Religion says be a good person. But the problem is one hour I'm a good person. Maybe. One minute I'm a good person. The next minute I have this horrible thought. I pretend I don't have it, but I really didn't. And so even my good works aren't constant. But the grace of God, a gift from God, that he makes you righteous. God doesn't take saints, he makes saints. And when you receive that gift, you have something constant to find your value in. It allows you to look at the mistakes you've made because you're like, yeah, that's probably what I did because he had to forgive that. When I get proud of what I've done, I'm like, that's really not that great anyway. And I look to what he's done. And that's where I find my identity. So the only constant in life is change. So don't chain your identity to something that's in constant change. Now, there's four things in here to get real practical. Let me get real practical. So we've been sort of ethereal and philosophical. Let's get real practical. Four remembers, I think, come out of this that we can apply in everyday life when we encounter problems or difficulties and chaining our identity to something that matters. What's the first remember? The first remember, I think, here in the beginning of this part is, remember, it's only a season. He says, to everything, there is a season. Now, chaining your identity to that is a bad idea. But when you're going through trouble, this is so freeing. Because you're thinking, whenever you have a problem, here's what happens. You think it's personal. God's out to get me. The world's out to get me. You think it's pervasive. Oh, my goodness. This area of my life, my whole life's wrecked. But the other thing is you think it's permanent. It's never going to get better. This relationship's never going to improve. My career's never going to turn back the way it used to be. 
And the Bible says, you're allowed, but by looking at your life through the lens of eternity and anchoring your identity in God, you can say, you know what? Whatever this is, it's just a season. This too will pass, might be a way of saying it. So you come through depression. You're going through a winter time in your, in your marriage and you're ready to give up. You say, whoa, 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 it's not permanent. It's winter, but there's a spring coming. And you remind yourself in the midst of your marriage struggle, it's just a season. I don't like this season. I remember when I lived down in Atlanta for about six years, I used to say, you know what I miss about the Midwest? The seasons. Now I live in the Midwest again. I forgot there are no seasons. Well, there are. It's rain, very rainy, sinus infection, and a little bit of sun. <laughs> so there's going to be seasons you don't like. But part of being able to endure difficulty in your life is to remind yourself it's not permanent, because that's the voice in your head, it's permanent. No, no, no. It's only a season, and that will help you endure. Think about Bob Dylan's words that Kenny sang for us at the beginning of the, of the service today. Come gather around people, wherever you roam. Admit that the waters around you have grown. It's getting bad. Accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. It's bad. If your time, if your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are changing. They're changing. Things will change. And you may feel like you're drowning one minute. But say, God, I want to remember this is a season. It's a season. I want to trust in you because you're forever. You're the anchor I can hold to in the midst of the season. Remember my daughter called home from college this year. So after my two months of blubbering about it, I decided to be happy for her. And uh, she had a difficult job. So she uh, worked in uh, catering. And so with those hours, very chaotic. She's used to working in scheduled moments. And every week her schedule would flip. She's never done it before. And she's like, oh, my dear, my boss is very difficult to work with. The schedule is very hard to figure out. I'm just, I'm just overwhelmed. I said, honey, just remember this. It's just a season. It doesn't feel like a season. I know. It's just a semester. Okay, if I could get out of this job. So I was home for Christmas. She found she had the same job weeping in our house. Honey, it's just a season. It's a longer season than you wanted, but it's just a season. Remind yourself that. And her boss actually had done a really bad job, so they fired her boss, and she's got a better boss now. And I said, you're going to learn from being managed poorly how to manage people well later because you don't want other people to feel like this. But remind yourself, it's only a season. If you remember the movie Captain Phillips, Captain Phillips endured, you know, incredible. He, he got, you know, taken hostage as a, as a sailor. And one of the tattoos that sailors have on themselves is one that says, hold fast. Whatever's going on, whatever difficulty you're facing, hold fast. And that was one of the secrets. He was able to endure this ordeal as he was kidnapped, which ultimately, you know, you know you've made it when, uh, when uh, Tom Hanks plays you in a movie. But that idea of holding fast to something that's constant is what we all need. I'm telling you, everything turns except for God who's forever. In fact, in Vietnam, there's a, there's a mantra they would tap to each other to, to encourage each other to keep, keep surviving during difficult times. And it was steady strain. Steady. Just stay steady. Strain in the midst of it. Strain, lean into this. It's only a season. However, in his book, Survivor's Club, he described the difference between those in a POW camp would say, well... I know I'm going to be out here by Thanksgiving. I know I'm going to be out here by Christmas. And they would set some arbitrary deadline and say, it's a season, and I know when the season's over. And they suffered from what the, uh, the book Survivors Club called um, Stockdale Paradox. You can put that on the next screen. Stockdale Paradox. Stockdale Paradox is when you say, it's only a season, and I know when the season is over. No, you don't. No, you don't. And often people who said that they would definitely be out of the POW camp by Thanksgiving or Christmas wouldn't. And they'd fall into deep depression and often died because of the arbitrary deadline. But, but in Survivor's Club, he said the people who survived lion attacks and, and snow and any difficulty in life are those who didn't set some arbitrary deadline, but they did tell themselves, this is only a season and I will win out on the end. That faith, that hope, that identity, that what I'm defined by isn't by what I'm going through, is what helped them survive a difficult marriage, a rebellious son, the death of a child, an attack, a parachute that didn't open. And it goes back to what the Bible offers here, which is that you can remember that it's just the season you're going through, that you can win in the end because forever will always trump what's temporal. The second thing we need to remember Remember that there's a purpose. Look what he says. 
Solomon, as he's reflecting on this, says, I've realized that though everything changes, a time for every purpose under the sun. I don't want to grieve. I don't want to mourn. But I realize there's a time for that. There's a time to grieve because when you grieve a daughter going off to college, it reminds you that you love them and that you had a treasured time together. There's a time to mourn. We had a funeral here uh, yesterday where I just wept and wept and wept trying to give the funeral for, uh, for Logan Brinson, who uh, was 19 and uh, just had such an impact in our community. And to think of a person the age of my daughter who had special needs like my son, and I just couldn't even read. I, read, I wrote all my notes and even... And I just couldn't blubber my way through it. But there's a time not to suppress emotions. Grief and mourning have a place. And this helps you see that even though there's a time you say, I didn't want to go through that, I didn't like that. What if, even if you don't believe it, what if you knew God could use that for a purpose? Wouldn't that help? Isn't what drains us the idea that I'm going through meaningless suffering? Oh, it's so meaningless. There's no point to this, we say. We shake our fists in the air and say, there's no way this could ever have a point. But if you remember... I don't see the point, but I'm going to trust that God can use this to bring about a purpose. It would infuse otherwise meaningless moments with purpose and hope. I was talking to a guy I went to lunch with recently, and he said, you know, I went through a season of just rebelling, incredible rebelling, making terrible choices during my college years. But I look back now, and I realize how God used that to accomplish a purpose of sort of shaking me and bringing me to my senses. He found a purpose even in a time of stupidity, which we all have. The third thing we need to remember, if we're going to put our identity in something constant, is we need to remember that God can leverage the worst for the best. I've seen the God-given task with which sons of men are to be occupied. Look what he says. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Now, that's not to say that everything is beautiful, because it's not. Being stabbed in the back by a business partner being sexually abused, going through rape. There is nothing beautiful about that. Yet instead of those things defining you, being defined by what happened to you, don't chain your identity to that. You're not garbage. You're not someone to be used. And what happens is that kind of trauma moves our identity, we suddenly be defined that we are a victim. But when you begin to say, no, no, I was victimized, and it was horrible. But instead of defining myself by being a victim, I'm going to define that as being victimized. And I'm going to work through that. But my true identity isn't defined by that. And even though God didn't want that to happen, and even though it wasn't beautiful, God will use that circumstance, that difficulty in my life, and he can make it beautiful because I'm going to use that pain to reach out to other people who are in pain. I'm going to let that, instead of making me bitter, make me better because I'm going to develop a sense of compassion. I'm going to create a radar to help protect people or look out for people. And though it wasn't beautiful, I'm going to trust that God can leverage the worst in life for the very best. I was down in Atlanta last week because I was speaking at my first church for their 30-year anniversary. And um, I remember baptizing my wife down there. And my wife had been through some trauma in her life. And I remember as we got to a place she was ready to be baptized, I remember she, she said, I had a, a dream last night that while I was going through a time of trauma that the camera sort of turned and twisted and showed that Jesus was in the corner and he was weeping with me. And that became such a healing moment for me that God was with me in the midst, that I'm ready to take the step of baptism and I'm ready to to move into a place of healing in my life. God can leverage the worst in your life for your best. Chris Everett, famous tennis player, she found that when she rooted her identity in winning, it didn't satisfy. But that began a journey of her looking where she could find meaning and purpose. Look what she says. I had no idea who I was after I retired because my identity was being a a tennis champ. What I could be away from tennis. I was depressed and afraid because too much of my life had been defined by being a tennis champion. I was completely lost. Winning made me feel like a somebody. It made me feel pretty. Chain yourself to tennis. Chain yourself to being a champion. Chain yourself to winning. Chain yourself to being pretty. 
It was like being hooked on a drug. I needed the wins, the applause, in order to have an identity. Instead, if you have an identity that says, hey, I didn't want this bad thing to happen, but my identity is set that there's a God who can make everything beautiful. It's powerful. Which brings us back to our main point. I think Solomon says this at the end. Don't chain your identity to something that changes. Instead, remember to chain your identity in every situation as things are going up and down. Remember in that moment to chain your identity to the one who never changes. He has put eternity into the hearts of men. That big hole in your life. And the only thing that can fill it up is say, a relationship with God allows me to enjoy all the things in my life without them flying all over the place, and without having that level of discontent. Because what really matters, what fills that hole was an identity that comes from God. Even having been a follower of Christ for 30 plus years, there's many times at which I know that to be true, but I function as if it's not true. I function as if my identity comes from something else. When I first started working here 12, 13 years ago, and I moved from speaking 15 times a year to 30, I began to put my identity in how well a sermon went. And, what, and sometimes that was great. Oh, my goodness, that was great, though. The applause defined how I felt about myself. The, ooh, that guy looked like he's falling asleep right there during the sermon. I must not get a job. It wasn't he stayed up late last night. No, no, it was personal. It was, I had a bad sermon. I wonder if all my sermons are getting this bad. I wonder if my career is... I see all these, these insecurities. I, I used to call it my Sunday afternoon funk. Because you got the adrenaline rush of, you know, went to one service, wow, applause, let's go to two services, applause, applause, it's like a double dose of the drug. Three services, applause, 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 a Saturday service. Chetty, you worn out? Why would I be worn out? It's more doses of applause. Until all of a sudden the afternoon funk came. Went out, went... Thank goodness, six more days and I get to prove I exist again and have a meaning and purpose in life. And I caught that. I, I realized I was doing that about seven years ago. And I decided to want to do great work because I love doing great work and compelling work and persuasive work. But I wasn't going to define myself by my work. And so on Sunday afternoons, I can't remember the last time I had a Sunday funk. And I've had a lot of bad sermons. And you're like, yes, you have. Amen. I don't know amen church, but I want to say there's some bad ones. But it doesn't define me. So on Sunday afternoons, I can go play volleyball, whether it was good or bad. Because I've anchored my identity to something that doesn't change. And God wants to offer that to you as well. Not to switch between the Western view and the non-Western view, between different flavors of inconsistent things. Because times they are changing. But the one thing that doesn't change is the grace and identity given to us by God, not by religion, through grace, that says you matter and you can be defined by who I say you are. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time today of just investigating into this and laughing about this and connecting with this idea. I just ask for each person that you would maybe uh, just tap us on the shoulder this morning. Let us know what is that good thing that we've allowed to be our defining thing. And though we may be in a season that's blessing us and rewarding us, you know there's a season coming it's about to curse us and crush us. So, Father, we just admit to you that we do that, and we admit to you that we need something better than that. Forgive us for thinking that we could be defined by something as silly as how our kids behave or, or what our quarterly numbers are. Help us to shoot higher to be defined by the one who made us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us today. Uh, as you head out today, if you came prepared to give us some offering boxes on the way out, we'd also love to put a name at the face and say hello to you this morning. Third door on your left is the hearth room. There's some uh, volunteers there. We'd love to say hi. Thanks again. We'll see you next week for Mother's Day. Mother's Day, guys. Mother's Day. <laughs>